Welcome class, Mr. Gurney here. Today we're going to do a lesson in both economic models and fitness. As we prepare for the AP exam, I want to remind you to access your AP Barron's review book. Not only are we doing readings and taking notes in it, but if you have any holes and you want supplementation for your knowledge of macroeconomics, please access this book, both for graphs and general concepts. What I'm going to do today is draw graphs in a driveway with chalk. I encourage you to do that if you have a driveway or a sidewalk nearby. Obviously, we're trying to maintain that six to 10 foot social distancing during this coronavirus crisis. If you don't have access to either of those, get out your notebook and simply use a pen and paper. I really urge you to be drawing graphs on blank paper because that is active learning as opposed to reading a graph in a book, which is much more passive learning when I look at it versus I have to draw it myself on a blank piece of paper. So let's start out with a little exercise. I'm going to be calling out different students and recognizing them. Uh, while we do our 20 jumping jacks, I want to recognize Lila Renwick Archibald. Lila was recently admitted and is accepted to go to the number one college university in the country. You're probably wondering what school that is. Some may think it's Harvard University. Some may think it's Princeton. Some may even think it's Yale. However, we all know that it's Washington University in St. Louis, Missouri. So congratulations to Lila on getting admitted to such a fine institution. So now we're good and warm. We got the blood flowing. And I strongly urge you to be doing exercise throughout your academic days to get oxygen into your blood system and your muscles. It's hard to study for six, eight hours straight without getting some fresh air. So fitness, exercise, anything you do, a brisk walk, shooting baskets, playing soccer, whatever it might be to get the blood going. Our first graph we're going to do is one that's very fitting given what's going on right now with the COVID-19 crisis. And we're going to be doing the PPC. So right now, Try to draw it before I do, all right? Say to yourself, what does that graph have in it? Well, it actually has a bowed out shape. It is concave to origin. And on the Y axis, we generally put consumer goods on the X and capital goods on the Y. But since we're in this crisis and we're fighting an enemy, the coronavirus, we're at war, we're putting guns in the y-axis and those guns in this case would be ventilators and masks and any kind of medical goods needed. We could even talk about the antiviral pills or uh, basic needles that hospitals need to help treat people with the virus. So those are our guns or our military and capital goods to fight the virus. And on this axis we would put the consumer goods known as butter, in quotes. And the butter right now, for most of us, is getting goods delivered to our homes, such as food and other necessary items. And right now, we're probably, as an economy, and President Trump recently had 3M and Tesla and General Motors and Johnson & Johnson allocate making less consumer goods and making more goods for the fight against the coronavirus, these capital goods. So we have a shift from point A, which was more consumer, to point B, which is more military or capital goods. And I'm going to label my graph, folks, PPC on the uh, southeast part of the graph. And let's remember, if I'm at point T or point X inside the curve, it means I'm not utilizing resources properly, namely labor. And if we look out here at point Y, Obviously, we're currently unable to get there. It is unattainable. What would get us there? Economic growth. And perhaps we're going to come out with either an antiviral pill, whether the chloroquine works or the azithromax or some other pill is developed to give us a remedy. And ultimately, hopefully, we're going to come out with a vaccination. But if we do get out to point Y, that is created by economic growth, and we would now have P 
PPC prime. So that's our first graph. Let's get back to the fitness, and I encourage you to exercise within each class that you're studying for. Next, I want to call out Calvin Jackson. Calvin, I know you've had a shoulder injury, and from football season, you had surgery, so if you can't access this exercise, please supplement a different activity for this one. I want to also give a shout out to Calvin, who predicted a 30% chance of a shutdown from schools because of the coronavirus. And sure enough, Calvin was right, despite being called an alarmist by his health teacher. So Calvin, nice call on the virus. And let's see if we can execute these push-ups. I know it's tough on your shoulder, Calvin. I'm gonna go with a flat back and I'm gonna look straight ahead. And Calvin, let's just pound out 10 push-ups. If you guys wanna do more, if you're a monster like Adrian Vukic, the Vukasaurus, and you can do more than 10, be my guest. If you're someone who can't do a push-up because of an injury or you have perhaps weak upper body strength, go down on your knees and do the push-ups like this. So we can modify the workout based on our own strength levels. All right, our second graph of the day, folks. Let's take a look at the Big Mama. And the Big Mama is the most commonly asked graph on the AP exam. And this is called, obviously, aggregate supply, aggregate demand. We're gonna put price level on the y-axis. We're gonna put real GDP on the x. I don't know if the chalk is legible on the driveway here. Supply goes up, why? Because supply to the sky. And then we've got demand down or demand descends. That's our aggregate demand slope right here. We're going to draw our dotted lines. Now, let's talk about what shifts this graph. The government does a $2 trillion bailout plan. And they're inevitably going to be doing more than the $2 trillion bailout plan for the coronavirus, giving money to businesses, allocating money to other things that will increase consumer spending, sending families money. That's going to shift aggregate demand to the right. So now I have AD prime. I'm going to draw some arrows and more dotted lines. And let's remember we're in a recession. So we're obviously going to have to draw LRAS, which is going to be to the right of equilibrium. So here is our equilibrium after the shift. And maybe we're going to factor in the Federal Reserve buying of bonds and lowering interest rates and creating a great deal of liquidity that Jerome Powell and his group have been doing. And that shifts AD to the right even more. And as we see now, we are much closer to full employment GDP, as evidenced by the LRAS. So that's our second graph. Let's get back to our fitness. I'm now going to call out Asia Harris. And Asia, why don't we do some mountain climbers? And this is a little bit of a different exercise. Some of you may not have done this. I'm starting with one knee forward and one leg back. And I'm going to go one, two. Three, four, five. Asia, I hope you can handle this. Let's go 20, Asia. Those of you who want to really get after it and do 50, be my guest. Asia and I are just going to do 20 today, knowing that we have more graphs to get to. All right, good job, Asia. And our next graph is going to be one that the AP uses frequently on exams, and that is the money market model, which is shifted whenever we have any Federal Reserve activity or change in demand for money, we're going to have nominal interest rates on the y-axis, and we're going to have quantity of money, big Q, on the x. And next, we're going to have a vertical line representing money supply labeled MS. And then we're going to have a 45 degree angled line, and this can be sloped, labeled MD. And let's remember, MD may shift for things such as transaction demand, 
speculation, um, and other sorts of factors that may shift MD to the right or left. And S tends to shift when the Federal Reserve makes actions. Like recently, they shifted MS to the right by buying bonds. So now I have MS prime. And as you see, the interest rate has gone down because now my intersection on that MS prime is lower by MD, intersects here, and now interest rates are lower. So that is our third graph of today's outdoor graphs and models to know. It's time to get back to some activity. I'm now going to challenge one of my baseball players, one of my athletes, a catcher who's used to getting down in the dirt and on the ground, and that's Anthony Locasto. Anthony, this is going to be the hardest activity of the day. If anyone can run it, it's you. We're going to be doing some burpees. And feel free to stop whenever this starts to hurt. All right? So when we do a burpee, we drop to the ground, get a push-up going, and then we jump to the sky. So push-up. If you've never done these, you may found these challenging. I know my guy Anthony has to get his catcher's gear on, has to pop up, catch fly balls, throw runners out, drop third strike. Throw a guy out stealing third base. Take charge of his team. Back up a throw at first base. So Anthony can certainly do the 10 burpees. The better question, Anthony, is can you handle this next graph we're about to do? And what I'm going to ask is you try to do the graph before I do it. And I know it's been a while since I saw you. And right now you should have a pretty good blood flow going. Your heart rate should be up nicely. Anthony, we're gonna draw loanable funds right now. What does the loanable funds market graph look like? Well, you may remember loanable funds are really, really fun. So we're gonna put real interest rates on the y-axis. And we're going to put quantity of loanable funds on the x-axis. And if I wasn't so out of breath, Anthony, I'd probably look, write that out. Loanable funds. In the middle of the graph, we're going to have a supply and demand graph, except it's labeled S subscript LF. Again, supply to the sky, or supply up and demand descends, or demand down, on the southeast portion of the graph. Now let's talk about what shifts this. This is a challenging one. We know this graph is used to show crowding out. So the Federal Reserve just bought a lot of bonds. That's going to increase the supply in the loanable funds market. They've increased the liquidity. However, we also know that the federal government did a $2 trillion spending plan, which is deficit spending. We don't have that money from tax revenues. So they are demanding money from the loanable funds market. So now I have DLF prime, and this is the crowding out. The interest rates are going up. And this is one of the side effects of doing deficit spending. Nonetheless, this increase in interest rate will not be offset too much by the fact that we're going to have a boon to aggregate demand and consumption because of the $2 trillion. Let's not forget, business and private investment only makes up 10 to 15 percent of GDP. So this increase in interest rates that causes some crowding out is not going to be enough of a deterrent to not do those spending plans. In addition, as we saw with the money market, the Federal Reserve is going to lower interest rates, which is going to therefore help out with the crowding out that we're seeing here in the loanable funds market. All right, so that's our fourth graph. Let's move on to our next fitness activity. 
And I'm gonna do something right now called jump lunges. Let's do some jump lunges. I'm gonna call someone out. One of my athletes, uh, Aaron Blake, AA Ron, we like to call him. And Aaron, we're gonna start with opposite hand to opposite leg. So I'm going right hand forward, left leg forward, and one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. I feel like I'm a workout fitness video expert. 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. Aaron, you're kicking a ball. Check it out, you're kicking a ball right now. All right, so those are our split squat jump lunges. And let's, Aaron, now let's do a new graph. And I don't know if this is gonna be on the AP. Apparently College Board is saying we're not responsible for the last unit, but I'd like you guys to know this graph because you're going off to college. Many of you are gonna study economics. So it's important that we know this graph for life. A lot of you are gonna be traveling overseas. I know it's hard to imagine now with the coronavirus raging and airports shut and international travel shut. But at some point we will get back to normal life, it may be a new normal, and we're gonna be traveling, and we're gonna be exchanging our US dollar for foreign currency. So we put the currency that's in question on the x-axis. So let's pretend Aaron is going to France to see his friend who plays on the French national soccer team. Jake Sadow, I'm not saying you don't have any friends on the French national team. Connor, Burke, maybe you have some friends. But I know Aaron does. And Aaron, your friend uses the euro in his or her country. Could be a her, could be a him. And I'm gonna put the US dollar in the numerator and I'm gonna put the euro in the denominator. So what is ever on the denominator is gonna be on the x-axis. So Aaron, wants to go to France to get his French baguettes, his French fries, his French hotel room, his French Eurorail pass to travel. So he's gonna have a simple supply and demand graph again inside here. And since Aaron is demanding Euros in order to have successful travel, we're gonna have a demand shift to the right of the euro, all right? If it asked about the US dollar in the same exact transaction, Aaron would be supplying US dollars in that foreign exchange booth. Let's remember we have this imaginary foreign exchange booth where Aaron would have to go with his US dollars and supply them, except that they're not asking about the US dollar, they're asking about the euro so he's going to be demanding euros in order to make those transactions in France. All right, that's our fifth graph. It's now time for our sixth activity. I'm gonna be calling out a new person and let's call out someone who's very outgoing, never minds when I call on them in class, Faith Morris. And Faith, we're gonna do uh, something on the ground here. We're gonna be doing planks. And let's try and keep a flat back. I'm gonna lean on my forearms. I'm gonna breathe. And I'm gonna do this for 30 seconds, let's say. And if you wanna get a little crazy with it, because I know we got some wild and crazy people in that class, Jake Eagleberg, Jonathan Ecker, Josh Berenbaum, Matthew Chang, Jake Gallen. I know you're a wild and crazy bunch. Maybe I march with my feet while I do my front plank. Or maybe I go in and out with my feet. All right, so Faith, if I'm not challenging you here, let's go for two minutes, or let's move into the marching, or in and out with the feet. All right, Faith, so our next graph is one that I know we did a couple of times right before the shutdown, and this is a staple of macroeconomics. Many of you may remember it came into big question during the stagflation of the 1970s when we had an oil crisis in this country and aggregate supply shifted so much to the left 
but we're obviously right now talking about the Phillips curve. And when we do the Phillips curve, let's remember on the y-axis we have inflation. How do we remember that? I is a vertical letter, and inflation is therefore on the y-axis. It has an inverse relationship with unemployment. And obviously our government right now is more concerned with unemployment than inflation. We're not worried about rising prices. As a matter of fact, oil is hitting 10-year, 15, 20-year lows right now. So we're not really worried about price level. We're more worried about our high unemployment rate and those claims that 3.3 million two weeks ago. Last week we had 6 million people file for unemployment. So that's a concern. So the way this graph works is we're going to have a curve going more convex to origin, kind of the opposite of the PPC graph. And I'm going to label this SRPC for short run Phillips curve. And that's going to be intersected by the long run Phillips curve, LR. PC. Folks, this graph is the only graph where a shift to the right is bad and a shift to the left is good. And all these other graphs, a shift to the right is good and a shift to the left shows contraction of the economy in some capacity. Not in this graph. So we could argue that the coronavirus, if it is here long term, and most health professionals believe that we're in the ramp up phase, maybe the peaking phase in New York right now, but we're gonna be with this for a while. So I'm gonna draw the LRPC shifting to the left, because I think this is gonna last more than just three months. Call me a pessimist or call me a realist. I'm in the Calvin Jackson camp. I like to be real about things. And as mentioned earlier, the government has chosen to try to fix the unemployment and is not worried about price levels. So we're going to see a shift on the curve from point A to point B, where ultimately all this trillions of dollars of spending, fiscal spending, should lead us away from unemployment and towards higher price level. So what shifts the short run Phillips curve? Any shifters in aggregate demand. What shifts the whole curve rather than a point shift, which I just mentioned from aggregate demand, would be a shifter of aggregate supply. So if we can somehow get capital goods and get more available, we would actually be able to shift the whole curve to the left. And this would be labeled SRPC. So if we can use aggregate supply shifters in a positive way, the SRPC prime shifts to the left. So that's your Phillips curve. It's been on the AP exam roughly 40% of the time. So I want to conclude today's session by saying we don't know what this year's AP is going to look like. As of now, we're hearing three free response questions. We're hearing probably no last unit or two, which would be International Trade and Currency Exchange. And my guess is, because we're going to be doing this remotely on a computer in the privacy of our own home, they're not going to want to give questions that uh, students could quickly access, either in their notes or in a textbook or in a workbook. So I'm expecting balance sheet questions, T account that is, checkable deposits, maybe a question about GDP and is this transaction part of GDP or is it not? maybe some questions about types of unemployment. But I don't think the AP is planning on asking simple questions where we would shift aggregate supply, aggregate demand, or we would shift money market, because they know students will be able to access that in their notes very easily while at home. So I think they're going to ask some cryptic, maybe off the beaten path questions. Having said that, I strongly urge you to continue to do this. Draw graphs on blank paper, in a driveway, on a sidewalk, keeping our social distancing in mind, and have fun doing it. Get a little exercise going, all right? So to finish up here, I'm going to call out one final student, and that's Kira MacGyver.
Um, I know we didn't have St. Patty's Day together, Kira, and I hope you're okay with that. I'm sure you celebrated with some corned beef and cabbage. But let's finish up the workout, Kira. I know you're a monster when it comes to getting after it. I see the Lululemon outfits you wear to class. So let's, uh, let's finish up with some crunches, okay, Kira? One, two, three. And Kira, I'm signing off now. But hey, folks, don't be afraid to email me with any questions. Obviously, I'm at dgurney at nredlearn.org. And you can follow me on YouTube where this video will be posted at Coach Gurney. So it's been a lot of fun, and I hope everyone's being safe, not going out, following the guidelines of social distancing. I know that's hard for you. And I will see you guys soon. Keep studying for that AP. Miss you guys.